Hi, I'm Jamie Ryan from Children's Mercy, Kansas City. Uh, today I'll be talking about the gluten-free diet and adherence. I have no disclosures for uh, today's presentation. Uh, the learning objectives for the presentation are for learners to be able to name the three primary foods that contain gluten, explain the reason for concern about cross-contact of gluten in foods, and to describe the biological and behavioral approaches of assessing dietary adherence in celiac disease. So currently, the only treatment for celiac disease is lifelong gluten-free diet. For the majority of patients, following a strict gluten-free diet will stop symptoms, heal existing intestinal damage, and prevent further damage. Symptoms may improve within days to weeks of starting the diet, although it typically takes three to six months for the small intestine to heal in children and up to two years in adults. Once the intestine heals, the villi will absorb nutrients from food into the bloodstream normally. Initiation of gluten-free diet also rapidly restores bone mass to normal levels in almost all children and some adolescents and can help prevent future complications such as lymphoma or other cancers. So what is gluten? Gluten is a storage protein found primarily in wheat, barley, and rye, and all foods made with these grains, such as breads, cereals, pasta, and baked goods. It's a substance that provides elasticity, allows bread to rise, and gives foods a chewy texture. For individual celiac disease, going gluten-free means eliminating all forms of these grains. Oats remain a controversial food in the celiac world. While they are naturally gluten-free, oats are grown in the same fields and processed in the same plants with wheat, barley, and rye. Therefore, they're contaminated unless careful steps are taken. Moderate amounts of pure, uncontaminated oats are safe for most people with celiac disease, but some individuals are highly sensitive and should avoid oats altogether. It's generally recommended that people with celiac disease introduce certified oats into their diet only under the supervision of their physician or registered dietitian. When starting the gluten-free diet, celiac patients must eliminate all gluten-containing grains and their derivatives, such as those listed in the red highlighted table. While many of the most commonly consumed grains contain gluten, there are plenty of nutritious grains available, gluten-free grains available too. Amaranth, for example, a high protein and high fiber, make it an especially useful choice for celiac patients who are also vegetarian. It can be used as a substitute for other grains such as rice. Alternatively, cooked amaranth that has been chilled can also be used in place of cornstarch as a thickening agent for soups, jellies, or sauces. Buckwheat, another option, is high in antioxidants and has been shown to lower inflammation and oxidative stress. It may also help reduce some risk factors for heart disease. Corn is among the most popular and versatile gluten-free grains. It can be boiled, grilled, or roasted and either eaten right off the cob or added to salads, soups, or casseroles. In addition to being high in fiber, corn is rich in carrot carotenoids that are associated with the decreased risk of eye disease. Sorghum is another fiber-rich grain that may help reduce inflammation and blood sugar levels. Sorghum has a mild flavor and can be ground into flour for baking gluten-free goods. It can also replace barley in some recipes. Despite being one of the smallest grains in the world, teff is another gluten-free grain that packs a nutritional punch. It's high in protein, provides plenty of B vitamins, and may fulfill a good portion of one's daily fiber needs. Teff can be used as a substitute for wheat flour during gluten-free baking and or as a natural way of thickening dishes. In order to completely remove gluten from the diet, less obvious sources of gluten must also be identified and avoided. Any product that can be adjusted may be a source of gluten, including medications, dietary supplements, toothpaste, mouthwash, lip balm, and postage. Gluten can also be found in some topical products, such as shampoos and lotions, but there's generally less concern unless the product is transferred from a person's hands to their mouth. Reading product labels can help people to avoid accidental gluten exposure. Gluten is used in many medications as an excipient which binds the pills together. The excipient is considered an inactive ingredient and there are no regulations regarding labeling of inactive substances. There are several types of excipients that drug companies may use and the excipient could be different in the generic version of a medication. Individuals with celiac disease should be advised to always check with the manufacturer to be sure that the particular medication is in fact gluten-free. While there's no regulated location to find out if a medication is gluten-free, a clinical pharmacist maintains the website you see here and the site is updated weekly. Please note, however, that this list does not guarantee that a product is gluten-free, and it's always best to double check with a pharmacist or with the medicines manufacturer. In addition to the required dietary changes, a vitamin or mineral supplement may also be necessary, especially when a person is first diagnosed with celiac disease. The damage previously done to the intestinal lining can lead to decreased nutrient absorption. The nutritional deficiencies observed in celiac disease can also be a consequence of the diet. 
Many gluten-containing breads, cereals, and pasta are fortified with B vitamins and iron, while many gluten-free foods are not. This can further contribute to vitamin and mineral deficiencies if a person with celiac disease eats a lot of these products. Following a gluten-free diet that is nutrient-dense, but not necessarily calorie-dense, and focuses on whole fruits and vegetables, lean proteins, and gluten-free whole grains, will provide the necessary nutrients for most people with celiac disease. However, for those with more severe or prolonged nutritional deficiencies, long-term supplementation may be necessary as long as they are using a gluten-free supplement. Dietitians can help patients by recommending fortified or enriched foods that are naturally gluten-free and high in calcium, iron, folate, and the fat-soluble vitamins generally found to be lacking in those with celiac. Calcium and vitamin D are necessary for healthy bone mineralization and the prevention of osteopenia and osteoporosis in celiac disease patients. Milk and dairy products, which are normally gluten-free, provide a convenient source of both calcium and vitamin D. Calcium can also be found in a number of whole foods like spinach, kale, dry fruits, and gluten-free grains, including quinoa and brown, wine, brown rice. Iron, folate, and vitamin B12. Several foods contain these, which are important for red blood cell formation. These include beef, poultry, fish, and seafood. Iron is found in additional sources such as beans, tofu, spinach, and even dark chocolate. Folate is particularly important for women of childbearing age and can be found in briefly lean vegetables, citrus fruits, and some types of beans and lentils. Fat soluble vitamins E and K are important for repairing the cellular damage that occurs with celiac disease and can be found in also green leafy vegetables. Vitamin E, a disease fighting antioxidant, can be found in seeds, kiwi, and vegetable oils, while vitamin K, important for proper blood clotting function, can be found in asparagus, dairy products, and soybean oil. An important part of successfully following a gluten-free diet is reading a package label carefully. This includes gluten-free claims on packages as well as product ingredient labels. Fortunately, the Food and Drug Administration labeling rule makes it easier to determine whether or not a packaged food product is safe for someone with celiac disease. According to the rule, a product can be labeled gluten-free if it is either naturally free of gluten or contains less than 20 particles per million of gluten. This level is the lowest that can be reliably detected in foods using scientifically validated methods. The FDA's regulation applies to all foods and beverages except for meat, poultry, and certain egg products that are regulated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and most alcoholic beverages. It also doesn't cover medications, cosmetics, or pet food. Currently, shopping for commercial gluten-free food, excuse me, gluten-free products is less difficult than in the past, but relying completely on the label can be tricky. It's important to know that gluten-free labeling is voluntary as manufacturers are not required to place a gluten-free label on a food product, even if it meets the FDA standards. The FDA also does not mandate the use of a specific gluten-free label or where it should be placed, both of which can vary across products. In light of these challenges, people with celiac disease should always refer to the product's nutrition label and ingredient list to confirm if something is in fact gluten-free. Gluten may be a basic ingredient in wheat, barley, or rye, or can be added during processing. And because manufacturers can change ingredients without warning, it's important to always read the label on a product, even if it's been safe in the past. After checking a product for a gluten-free symbol or declaration, such as the symbol shown here, look for a contain statement usually found below the ingredients and see if wheat is listed. If the label contains an allergen advisory statement, such as may contain wheat, processed in a facility that also processes wheat, or processed on a shared equipment with wheat, there are a few things to keep in mind. Allergen advisory statements are voluntary. Manufacturers may choose not to include them on food labels, even if a product is processed using shared equipment or facilities. If a product is labeled gluten-free, consumers are advised to trust the label regardless of allergen advisory statements for wheat or gluten. This is due to the gluten-free labeling rule applying to both gluten and ingredients and gluten that may be found in a product due to cross-contact. However, when it comes to foods not labeled gluten-free but appearing to be gluten-free based on ingredients, there are no established guidelines for individuals with celiac disease on whether they should avoid these products with allergen advisory statements. For products that are not certified or labeled gluten-free, Read the ingredient list for wheat, barley, or rye, or oats, unless certified gluten-free, and other hidden sources of gluten. Most pack packaged products also include a phone number to reach the manufacturer to verify gluten-free status. Additionally, manufacturer websites are another great option and can often, often contain a list of which products are gluten-free. If after taking these steps, there's still uncertainty about an ingredient or a product label, it's probably best to find an alternative. Though the first step in treating celiac disease is eliminating obvious exposures to gluten, 
It's also essential to avoid accidental exposure via cross-contact. Cross-contact occurs when a gluten-containing ingredient or food comes into contact with a gluten-free food. And as a result, each food then contains small amounts of the other food. The amount of gluten that can be tolerated varies among people with celiac disease. However, there's evidence to demonstrate that eating as little as 50 milligrams of gluten per day, or the equivalent of a piece of pasta or a few crumbs of bread, can cause significant changes in the mucosal, mucosal histology. There are a number of obvious and not so obvious ways in which cross contact can occur at home and in restaurants or other food service locations, such as those listed here. Fortunately, there are several ways excuse me, several steps that can be taken to decrease the risk of gluten exposure due to cross contact. When shopping for groceries, it is advisable to stay away from open or bulk bins since gluten-free products can become contaminated if the same scoop is used in more than one bin or pieces of food from different bins get mixed together. Similarly, prepared foods from the store's deli, hot bar, or salad bar are at risk for cross-contamination. Cross Gluten-containing foods may be prepared on the same surfaces or with the same utensils as gluten-free items. At the deli counter, asking for the slicer to be clean before slicing any meats and cheeses is one way to reduce this risk. As with approaching any potential sources of cross-contact, using good judgment to assess the safety of food, item, food items is key. Cross-contact can occur at home too. When using condiments or any food item from a reusable jar, it's important to be aware of double dipping. Utensils are okay the first time, but once they have touched the food with gluten, they can contaminate the food in the container if used again. This can be prevented by purchasing some condiments like jam, mustard, and mayo in squeeze bottles. Other possible options are to get double of condiments or to sort them into two separate containers and label one gluten-free. There are several kitchen appliances and utensils that require increased caution as well. Pop-up toasters are virtually impossible to thoroughly clean and pose a significant issue for use in a shared household or when traveling. If it is inconvenient to have two toasters with one designated gluten-free, toaster bags can be used to provide a barrier between items placed in the bag and the toaster itself. A good solution for toaster ovens is to always line the racks with foil when toasting gluten-free items. Additionally, strainers and colanders easily keep gluten in crevices that are very difficult to clean. It is best to purchase a separate set, possibly in a different color, and to keep them stored away from gluten-containing items. Similarly, plastic or wooden items, as well as those with non-stick coatings, may develop grooves from wear and tear that can collect gluten, so it's advisable to consider replacing these as well. In terms of safe, stu food safe storage practices, one approach is to create a gluten-free area in the pantry, refrigerator, or freezer, preferably on a top shelf. This will help prevent crumbs or pieces of gluten-containing foods from falling into gluten-free products. Clearly labeling all products that are gluten-free can also help to avoid possible confusion. Though it can be easy to overlook, good hand hygiene is critical in helping to avoid cross-contact during food preparation. Again, when possible, it can help to have dedicated kitchen space to prepare gluten-free food. Otherwise, countertops must be cleaned often to remove gluten-containing crumbs. Shared cooking utensils, cutting boards, and pans also need to be cleaned thoroughly after each use and before cooking gluten-free products. Additionally, gluten-free and gluten-containing items should never be fried in the same oil since gluten particles can fall into the oil and contaminate the gluten-free food. The same goes for cooking pasta, vegetables, or other foods in the same water. If possible, consider preparing the gluten-free foods first, or be sure to clean the pots and utensils and get new oil or water before cooking the gluten-free products. Lastly, if a meal contains both gluten-free and gluten-containing foods, each dish needs to have its own serving utensil. And even so, for family-style meals, it is advised that individuals with celiac disease serve themselves first because there's no assurance that other people won't double dip or that pieces of food that contain gluten won't accidentally fall into the gluten-free dish. With all of this, it should also be noted that based on a recent study, there are new questions being raised about how risky certain food, food preparation and scenarios are, and that more work is needed to provide evidence-based recommendations. Despite its critical importance, adherence, or the extent to which celiac patients follow a strict gluten-free diet and other medical advice, is less than optimal. Specifically, it's been estimated that 5 to 40 percent of youth and 9 to 58 percent of adults with celiac disease continue to have ongoing gluten exposure after diagnosis, either intentionally or unintentionally. Studies also indicate poor follow-up among celiac patients, with a quarter of pediatric patients and more than half of adults lost within a year of diagnosis, and a smaller subset having no visit after the diagnostic biopsy. Possible reasons for the variability in adherence rates across studies include the use of different measurement methods and definitions of adherence, the time since, since diagnosis, and the nature of the study population itself, with some using community samples, whereas others may be using a reference center. 
It is generally well established that the gluten free diet of adherence declines in adolescence. Developmental characteristics of adolescence, including the desire for more autonomy, the importance of peer relationships, and increased risk taking behavior, present normative obstacles for adherence. Compared to younger children, parents also tend to have less involved in dietary decisions and are less able to provide supervision in social settings that involve meals or snacks. It's important to note that once a person with celiac disease has consumed gluten, there's no medical way to stop the reaction, which could last from a few hours to several days. How a person reacts after eating gluten can also vary. Some people may experience new or ongoing symptoms, such as diarrhea, severe abdominal pain, vomiting, or headaches, while others can have no noticeable symptoms. However, it must be emphasized that even in the absence of visible symptoms, intermittent exposure to gluten can cause inflammation and damage to the intestine and lead to malnutrition, cancer, and the development of other autoimmune conditions later in life. Patients can face a multitude of barriers to following a strict gluten-free diet. The cost of gluten-free products, while declining over the past 10 years, remain significantly higher than their standard counterparts. And depending on the community and geographic location, the availability of gluten-free foods at local restaurants can be extremely limited. Patients can also have particular difficulty adhering to a gluten-free diet when dining out or at social events due to variability in gluten-free food options or across contact with gluten. Not adherence can also occur due to factors like unclear labeling of gluten-free products and patients not liking the taste of gluten-free foods and alternatives. Related, how celiac patients feel about the diet and their attitude towards a restrictive lifestyle can serve as another potential barrier. For example, feeling deprived of the favorite food or embarrassed to bring gluten-free food to a social function have been associated with lower dietary adherence. And of course, a lack of knowledge about the gluten-free diet or confusion over reading product labels can also make it increasingly difficult to be adherent. Assessment of gluten-free diet adherence is essential for identifying patients at risk for poor health outcomes. However, there's currently no consensus on the optimal frequency of monitoring or the best tools for assessing dietary adherence. A variety of methods are available to assess adherence and each has its own strengths and limitations. In general, patient or parent report measures of dietary adherence are relatively simple, inexpensive, and easy to administer in a clinic setting. How individuals are questioned about adherence, however, may be critical in the quality of the data obtained by these reports. Questions that are specific and time limited are likely to yield more accurate information about adherence behaviors as they are less subject to recall errors or misunderstanding. No gold standard questionnaire for measuring patient adherence in celiac disease currently exists, although there are some validated questionnaires available, such as the Celiac Dietary Adherence Test. However, it has currently only been validated for use in adults. Food diaries and structured interviews by a dietitian can offer additional advantages of providing detailed information on adherence patterns and the types of barriers being encountered. In celiac disease, nutritionist evaluation to identify and quantify the degree of dietary transgressions has been shown to be an excellent measure of gluten-free diet adherence with acceptable cost, non-invasiveness, and correlation with histologic changes in some studies. However, this approach is time-consuming, subject to inner observer variability, and in many cases, limited by a lack of adequately trained personnel. Unfortunately, all self-report measures are sensitive to social desirability effects, in which a patient may tell a provider what they want to hear in order to avoid their disapproval, which could ultimately lead to overestimated adherence rates. Symptom assessment and the evaluation of celiac disease-associated antibodies are the most frequently used methods to assess patients during follow-up but the utility and adherence measurement remains challenging. In most cases, persistence of symptoms is associated with in inadvertent gluten ingestion, but can also be caused by irritable bowel syndrome, microscopic colitis, lactose or fructose intolerance, pancreatic insufficiency, and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Moreover, a large number of celiac patients are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic at presentation, indicating that clinical response alone is inadequate to assess adherence. Serological tests, compared to self-report measures, carry the advantage of functioning independently from patient knowledge or their openness about dietary transgressions, but they're poorly correlated with histological findings or symptoms in celiac patients on a gluten-free diet. Most patients have negative antibody tests on a gluten-free diet, even those with persistent mucosal damage. While celiac serology can be useful with following concentrations of celiac-specific antibodies indicating gluten reduction, the normalization of these antibodies does not identify minor dietary transgressions and therefore has limited ability to assess complete adherence. Small bowel histological assessment is the only definitive way of determining mucosal healing, but this may not occur even in patients with strict gluten-free diet adherence. 
Furthermore, persistent enteropathy does not always predict long-term outcome, and histologic abnormalities can have causes other than gluten exposure. These factors, along with the cost and invasiveness, render serial endoscopy impractical for frequent monitoring. With the advent of portable gluten in sensors, celiac patients can now conduct their own point-of-service testing of foods to check whether it contains gluten. This can be particularly helpful in restaurants where cross contact with gluten is a constant concern. One such sensor, NEMA, is a small portable device that can be used to test foods for the presence of gluten, but it does not quantify the amount present. Because of this, the device may show gluten found if trace amounts, sometimes even below 20 parts per million, are there. NEMA also only tests the pea size sample that is in the device and therefore cannot guarantee that an entire item or dish is gluten free. There are also limitations around NEMA's ability to detect gluten in all substances. For example, it isn't able to detect hydrolyzed gluten or gluten in fermented foods, such as soy sauce or gluten removed beers. Unlike traditional methods to monitor adherence, which only evaluate the consequences of dietary transgressions, new tests can actually measure gluten fragments in the urine or stool of anyone who eats gluten. GIP measurement is a non-invasive option that has the advantage of carrying being very specific to gluten intake, although the time frame for detection is relatively short, usually six, two to six days. Currently, urine tests are positive if an individual has consumed a fairly significant amount of gluten, while stool tests will pick up trace amounts. Their utility in comparison with con conventional dietary and analytical follow-up strategies, however, has not been fully established and ongoing studies will likely clarify their role in celiac disease management. While maintaining a gluten-free diet can be challenging, we find that patients with celiac disease and their families generally do better and have higher rates of adherence when they are equipped with proper knowledge, guidance, tools, and resources. Medical and other healthcare providers are in a great position to help celiac patients start a successful gluten-free diet. It's common for people to focus on foods that they can't eat, but again, a dietitian with expertise in celiac and the gluten-free diet can offer recommendations for good gluten-free versions of favorite foods and can oftentimes provide individualized gluten-free modifications to traditional family recipes. To help with some of the financial burden associated with the diet, individuals with celiac disease may be educated about gluten-free food tax deductions, gluten-free food fairs that hand out samples of products, and places to check for coupons on gluten-free brands. In general, families should know which foods are naturally gluten-free to avoid paying for a gluten-free label, and be informed of mainstream brands like General Mills and Frito-Lay that offer gluten-free items at a reasonable price. While there's no doubt that following a gluten-free diet requires additional planning and preparation, there are a few ways to save time and still make healthy gluten-free meals. This can be started by keeping things simple. Identify eight to 10 family favorite meals and rotate through these choices for one to two months. Other ways to save time are to plan for leftovers by making one and a half or doubling a recipe of per single meal and having it throughout the week. Buying pre-chopped vegetables at the grocery store, or even trying um, gluten-free slow cooker recipes that can be left cooking while individuals do other things. Social support and school integration are critical for successful adherence to the diet. Individuals with celiac disease may benefit from interventions in which they learn how to communicate about their dietary restrictions with friends, classmates, teachers, and other community members in ways to problem solve around challenging social situations. Patients may also be referred to national organizations such as the Celiac Disease Foundation or Celiac Support Association that can offer additional opportunities for education about the diet and promotion of appropriate dietary options. Celiac disease support groups can be, par be particularly helpful in identifying gluten-free products available at local supermarkets and restaurants. They can also provide the opportunity for emotional and psychological support, which in turn may reduce feelings of isolation, enhance patient empowerment, and help facilitate the adherence to the diet. Sometimes patients may need more help than a support group or family to provide, in which case referral to a therapist who specializes in adjustment and coping with chronic diseases can help. In summary, the mainstay of celiac disease is a strict, lifelong gluten-free diet, which requires avoidance of all products containing wheat, barley, and rye. Gluten exposure from cross-contact may lead to ongoing disease activity and is of concern, although more research is needed in order for it to be evidence-based. Complete adherence to a gluten-free diet is often difficult to achieve for many families. Availability, cost, and product labeling are some of the most significant barriers to adherence. Available gluten-free monitoring tools are insufficient to detect occasional exposure, and more recent research is needed on the adherence assessment measures in celiac disease.